the most disturbing of all time. And towards the end of her captivity, Junko Furuta was barely visually recognizable. Her abuse took place over 40 days, and honestly, the resulting prosecutions are a total joke. Junko Furuta was a 16-year-old high school girl who was kidnapped and tormented over the course of 44 days, resulting in her death. Her body was disposed in an old drum filled with concrete, hence this case is often referred to as Concrete Encased High School Girl Murder Case. In this video, I want to look at what happened to Junko, what came about it, and perhaps the broader issue in society that allowed for such atrocity to happen in the first place. This case took place in the late 80s, so some of the details and theories are murky as to what happened. I will be providing every theory that I could find and tell you what I think was more likely to have happened. As you may have seen the title card at the start, this case is not for the faint of heart. It is often believed to be the worst case of juvenile delinquency, as you'll see. What happened to Junko was gruesome and horrific to say the least. I will not be showing anything graphic in this video, but I will have a Google Doc linked in the description containing all the sources that I've used that you can have a look at for more details if you're interested. But do keep in mind that it is quite graphic. This video will also be censored as much as possible because YouTube also, as you may have guessed, this case took place in Japan, so the names and the places that I will be referring to today will be in Japanese. Now, I am obviously not Japanese, nor do I speak Japanese, so apologies in advance if I mispronounce anything, let me know down in the comments below. So, without further ado, this one is for Junko. Junko Furuta was born on the 18th of January 1972 in the city of Misato in the Saitama region of Japan. She attended Yashio Minami High School and was your stereotypical good girl. She was studious, obedient, and well-liked by her peers. She stayed out of trouble, did not smoke nor drink, and was focused more on her studies and career as she was looking forward to graduation and attending college. The perpetrators of this crime were four teenage boys, Miyano Hiroshi, Minato Nobuharu, Jo Kamikazu, and Watanabe Yashushi. On the night of 25th of November 1988, as Junko was returning home from her part-time job, she was spotted by Miyano and Minato. Now, some say that they were just wandering around looking for trouble, as Miyano had connections with Yakuza, which is one of the largest crime syndicates of Japan, and Junko just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. However, there are rumors that Miyano was interested in Junko, but she turned him down, so they targeted her to take some sort of revenge. I think it's a bit of both, because as you'll see, what happened to Junko was far more heinous than anything that this young man had ever done. Being in Yakuza, they had criminal records consisting of robbing and raping women. But what they did to Junko, I refuse to believe that it was without any ill motive. So under Miyano's orders, Minato kicked Junko off her bike and fled the scene as Miyano approached her. Under the pretense of accident, Miyano offered to help walk her home. However, he soon led her to a warehouse where he revealed his Yakuza connections and raped her, then again at the nearby hotel. The gang eventually took her to Minato's house, which soon became their regular place to hang out, and where Junko was kept captive for the next 44 days. Over the course of 44 days, Junko was repeatedly beaten, raped, and tortured. Some accounts say that she was raped over 400 times by other Yakuza members as well. Some sources state that she even fell pregnant due to forced repeated penetration despite her injuries. Some of the ways in which Junko was tortured include having foreign objects inserted in her anus and private parts, such as bottles, scissors, iron bars, skewers, lit match, fireworks, and light bulb. She was starved and fed live cockroaches and forced to drink her own urine. She was force-fed large amounts of alcohol, milk, and water. The four kidnappers shaved off her pubic hair, forced her to masturbate and strip in front of them. Her left nipple was ripped off with pliers. Her face was held against concrete and jumped on. 
Her hands were tied to the ceiling and her body was used as a punching bag. She was beaten with bamboo sticks, golf clubs, iron bars. She had her hands smashed with weights and fingers clapped. Iron weights were dropped on her stomach, causing damage to her internal organs to the point she couldn't stomach any food or water. During the winter of Japan, she was forced to sleep on the balcony with minimal clothing. Junko was pretty much their sex life that they used to take their anger out. They found out about her address from her notebook that she kept in her school bag and threatened to kill her family if she attempted to escape. On 27th of November, Junko's parents filed a report of her missing. But to discourage further investigation, they forced Junko to call her mother and say that she was safe. She had just run away and was staying with some friends. When Junko attempted to escape, they lit her legs on fire after dousing it with lighter fluid, resulting in convulsions, to which the kidnappers went on to say that they thought she was faking a seizure. The worst part was, in my opinion, Minato's parents were aware of what was going on, but they knew that their son had connections with Yakuza and feared retaliation and their own son's violent adverse towards them. Around his parents, Junko was forced to act like one of their girlfriends, but they soon dropped this pretense when they realized that they were not going to get in trouble. The police even visited their home at one point, but they just assured them that Junko wasn't there and apparently that was enough for the police as they never returned home. It's just all around everyone failed her, especially the justice system. It all came down on 4th of January over a game of martial. Now, some sources say that Miano vented his anger out on Junko after losing a game of Mahjong the night before. Others claim that it was Junko that beat them at the game, which caused them to be enraged. I think the former may be more accurate because at that point, Junko was severely weakened, malnourished, and I don't think she would have been capable of playing such a complex game, in my opinion, and winning at that stage. But nevertheless, it resulted in them attacking Junko for reportedly two hours until she couldn't take it anymore and passed away. Less than 24 hours of her death, her body was wrapped up in blankets and shoved into a travel bag, which was put in a 55-gallon or 210-litre oil drum and filled with wet concrete, then disposed in a cement truck. When Junko's mother finally found out about what had happened to her, she passed out on the spot and had to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital and honestly i don't blame her the way it was found out was quite interesting so on the 23rd of january miano and kamikazu was arrested for the gang rape of a 19 year old woman in december there was also a case of the murder of her mother and her seven year old son in the previous year that was still ongoing so the interrogation officer decided to play a little trick on miano saying you mustn't kill someone you know, and Miano, thinking it was about Junko, confessed and said, I am sorry that we killed. Everyone was astounded because it was just a trick. But eventually they managed to find Junko's body and her funeral was held on the 2nd of April 1989. The headmaster of her school presented her with a graduation certificate, so in a spiritual sense she was able to graduate with all her friends. The sentencing was an absolute joke. At the time of prosecution, the criminals were juveniles, so their identities were initially sealed, but due to the egregious nature of their crime, a Japanese newspaper published their names and photos. All four of them pled guilty to committing bodily injuries that resulted in death rather than murder, which again, I think is bullshit. Miyano Hiroshi, who was the alleged leader of this crime, was sentenced to 17 years in prison which was later amended to 20 years. The other three received less than 10 years of imprisonment, with Minato's parents not even being charged. And even then, it was far from being effective. Kamikazu, for example, bragged about such a heinous crime and was arrested again soon after his release. One of the guys' mothers apparently vandalized Junko's grave, stating that Junko ruined her son's life, their family reputation, blamed her for depleting their family savings as a portion of which they had to be paid off to Junko's family as reparations, which is so bizarre to me. I really hope Junko's spirit haunts them for the rest of their lives. I think even death sentence would be too lenient for what they have done.
Junko's story understandably caused public outrage both in Japan and on an international level. But I think, on a broader sense, it reveals quite a regressive nature of Japanese society in terms of gender roles and equality. Especially here in the West, as more of Japanese culture becomes mainstream, I think most people here have this idea of Japan being this utopia where it's peaceful, everyone's polite, and everywhere is safe, while it is true to some extent, especially when compared to other places. But underneath all that, there is a lot of ugly that is hidden, which I think was reflected here in this case. Because the way this crime was dealt with says awful lot about the society that it is from. In the documentary titled Japan's Secret Shame, Shiori Ito comes forward with a public rape allegation in 2015, which is often referred to as the first Me Too case of Japan. Throughout the documentary, Ito's journey towards justice is frustrating and often infuriating to watch, as her case is labelled a black box from the get-go, with questionable practices like reenactment of the incident with a human-sized doll, interrogation of victim, and a lack of social support. At the time of making this documentary, Japan's rape laws remained the same since 1907, with a shorter minimum sentence for rape than there was for theft. Japan's age of consent is 13, which was widely criticized, and currently Japan is ranked 120th out of 156 in terms of gender equality. Combined with the groupist nature of Japan and the taboo of the topic, many sexual violence victims do not report their assaults to police or support groups. Chikan, which translates to groping, is an ongoing issue faced by Japanese women, especially in crowded trains. The problem became so severe that in 2000, female-only trains were introduced. <laughs> But going back to Shunko, I think it's important that her story is viewed from the lens of bravery rather than of sympathy. Despite the inaccuracy of some events, Junko showed tremendous bravery for what is widely referred to as 44 days of hell. From rejecting Miyano to surviving this ordeal to even beating them in the game of Mahjong, Junko didn't give up. She constantly challenged them, stood her ground, and fought till the end. If that isn't bravery, I don't know what is.